He says, because menstrual blood is distinct from other types of blood. He says, In other words, we have a woman. A woman bleeds for 20 days. Alright? 20 days. There's no doubt that this blood is irregular. It's not normal. It's not the blood of mints for 20 days. What is she to do? 20 days not pray? 20 days not fast? 20 days she can't be intimate with her husband? 20 days she can't make anti calf. 20 days she can't sit in the masjid, 20 days she cannot read or touch the mushaf, so on and so forth. He says, when she sees the blood of minces, then she considers herself to be a mincing woman. In other words, among those 20 days, let's say the 7th day to the 11th day, the blood is thicker than normal. It's darker than normal. It has an odor not like the blood in the beginning or the end of those 20 days. Then she is to consider that blood between the 7th and the 11th day to be what? Blood of minces. But the blood, day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4, day 5, day 6, is blood of other than minces. It's what we call al-istihada, irregular bleeding. The blood on the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th day. That blood is all considered to be irregular blood. Because she distinguishes between menstrual blood and blood that is not menstrual blood. Clear, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, he says here that the blood of menses is well known. What it looks like, what it smells like, it, the rest of its character. Alright, the rest of its uh, traits. Khair, inshallah. As for um, those days in which it's not that type of blood, then she acts as if she's a normal woman. She acts as if she's a normal woman. The author he then says... And when she sees the blood, other than the blood of menses, then she's like a normal woman. And she has the ruling of all pure people. In other words, on that first day, it's not the blood of menses. Based off of the color of the blood, based off of her back pains, or whatever the case may be, she's like a normal person. She makes salah, she performs hajj and tawaf, she fasts, and according to some of the ulama, not all of them, but according to some of the ulama, she can have vaginal sexual intercourse with her husband. Okay? She can sit in the masjid. Those ulama who say that she cannot touch the mushaf, she cannot touch the mushaf because she's clean. Even though there's blood coming from her. Because it's not the blood of a mince. It isn't the blood of what? Of a mince. It's not the blood of a menstrual cycle. He says, And she should wash off the blood. She should clean herself from the blood. All right? And she should also perform, perform wudu for each prayer. Each, whenever the time for the adhan comes. Not before the salat, but after the salat. The salat is in now. It's time for dhuhr. She should cleanse her private area, wash off the blood, and perform wudu. Then she can make the obligatory prayer, dhuhr prayer, and any other recommended acts of prayer between dhuhr and asr. Now, a side issue here. We don't want to go too far off, but a side issue is... Is she allowed to combine between two prayers? Can she make dhuhr and asr? Can she make maghrib and isha together? Because she made one wudu. The author didn't mention that. Some other ulama said that, but that's not what the author mentioned here. He says she should make wudu for every salah. Make wudu for every salah. And this pertains to the issue of a person that we call in the Islamic sharia, uh, sahib al-hadith al-da'im. The person who has constant ritual impurity. Let's say a man had an illness in which he constantly broke wind. He does not make wudu for fajr and pray until the end of the day to isha with one wudu. La. He must make wudu for every single prayer. And the moment the next prayer comes in, he should renew his wudu. So therefore, the author, he didn't mention combining the salat. Another issue that the author didn't mention was ghusl. Alright, is it obligatory or recommended for her to make a ghusl for every salat time? The author said wudu. He then said, وَالْحَائِذُ لَا تُصَلِّي he says a mincing woman is not allowed to offer the salah. She does not pray. The obligatory prayer, the recommended prayer, any prayer, istikhara, she does not pray. He says, Wala tasum, nor should she fast, nor is she allowed to fast. Ramadan, Shawal, Mondays, Thursdays, she should not fast. He says, Wala hatta ba'da tuhur, nor is she to have vaginal sexual intercourse until she makes her ghusl. Until she makes her bath after her menstrual cycle. Now, 
why did he mention this and why do we translate it like that? Because we've explained before or we've said in some question and answer sessions, if a woman is mincing, then is nothing that prevents her from being intimate with her husband. But she is not allowed to have vaginal sexual intercourse with her husband. We also mention that in Islam, and we say, uh, once again, there's no shyness when it comes to learning and studying. Anal sex is impermissible in Islam. As for if a woman touched her husband, if her husband touched her, if she did this with her husband, if she rubbed and touched her husband, and he lay with her, so on and so forth, then that's permissible. However, he is not allowed to enter into her. He is not allowed to have vaginal intercourse with her. If they did other types of sexual acts, then that's lawful. That's permissible. But when she finished her menstrual cycle, the author's opinion, she cannot have vaginal intercourse until she makes a ghusl. And the reason why he said that is because some ulama, they have other views. Khayrin, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He then says, وَتَقْضِ siyam." And a missing woman should make up the days that she missed when she was fasting. The days in which she fasted, or excuse me, when she didn't fast out of Ramadan, she makes them up. But she does not make up the salah. This is the end of the chapter of menses. He then says, Faslun. He said, Now in a subchapter, Finnifas. Of pre or post natal bleeding. And al Islam, we have that which is called an nifas. And an nifas is the blood that comes from a woman's private area before or after childbirth before or after childbirth what is the ruling on this blood is it like menstrual blood can she pray so on and so forth the author says when he he says the maximum amount of time that a woman can have the blood of nifas is 40 days so we clearly see that he's different huh in contrast than his opinion with regards to the menses that there is a maximum amount of time so in other words, if a woman bleeds for 41 days, on that 41st day after childbirth, that blood is no longer what? It's no longer nifas. And then it goes back to what you previously studied. On the 41st day, is the blood menses? Or is the blood istihada, irregular? That depends on the characteristic of the blood. That depends on huh, the time in which it comes. Let's say on the 41st day, it's the beginning of the month. And that is when her menses come. Or the middle of the month. So as we said before, we say once again, over and over and over again, from one thing, learn 10,000 things. You have to build your knowledge and stack it on top of each other. And if you rush through your studies, or you do not understand properly, or you have a bad teacher, unfortunately, may Allah help me, you have a teacher that's not giving you a thorough, uh, uh, he's not teaching you thoroughly, he's rushing through something, then you're going to be confused later on. So if you rush through one concept, the next concept, you're going to pay for it. And you may think that you're cheating or that you're getting ahead and I'm saving time, but in reality, you're only hurting yourself. And as they say, no pain, no gain. That which comes easily, leaves easily. All right? Men rama lilma jumla, dhahba anhu jumla. The one who wants knowledge easily overnight, as we say, like a piece of uh, pound cake, like a slice of pie. That's how the knowledge is going to go away from you. But that what you work for, that what you fight for, that what you make yourself understand, and you take your time, it will stay and remain with you. The author then says, And there is no limit for the minimum amount of time of nifas. Nifas could be for a day, it could be for two days, it could be for three days, just like menses. He then says, And a woman who has nifas is just like a woman who has menses. In other words, she doesn't mix a lot. She doesn't fast. She doesn't have vaginal intercourse, etc. etc. And there's another proof for what we said before. Once again, that from one thing, learn 10,000 things. You have to combine your knowledge and put it together. And we have a thorough, comprehensive understanding of what to do and what not to do. Khairan, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, of course... This is a summarized book. We didn't mention no delil. We didn't mention too many other views. We didn't go into the furu'at, the subsidiary issues, the different branches, the different aqisa, the different analogies that we can make, and different hypothetical scenarios and situations. We're not getting to that right now. We don't have the time, and that is not the level of our study. But there are many other issues with regards to minces, especially, as we said before, when a young girl has her first mince. What does she consider to be the amount of time? A day or three days, 
Does it have to? Uh, and when does she consider herself to be that al adat al mutakarrira? When does she consider herself to be a woman who has a normal cycle? Some ulama say that it has to take place three times. For her to have the same cycle three times, then that's her normal cycle. We're not going to get into that right now. Those are all other issues. Perhaps we'll do another class on that uh, outside of this book. Or perhaps those answers will come in a Q&A session. Um, and we've also done class on this a while back. Khair, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to stop here. The next lesson that we will take from this book is Kitab al-Salah, the chapter of the prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. If somebody has something to add or something they want to correct or question or something like this, then feel free to post them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We ask Him, the mighty and the majestic, to give us beneficial knowledge, to give us understanding in the deen, and allow us to act upon it and teach others. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.